your departure from Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Um, can you elaborate on uh, when you left, the circumstances around it? I think you've told it one other time on Cornette's show maybe. But uh, right. anything, anything you can share on that? Because a, a lot of people did did question it on the Facebook group. They were like, how did it end? You know, what happened? So uh, what, what happened when, when you ended up uh, getting the boot by Cornette? Well, um, I had, you know, I told you I had this shitty job in a warehouse that I didn't care about. Right. And I was firmly convinced, and by this point, Cornette's already started going to WWE, or WWF, as it was called, you right. know, with the heavenly bodies. They're, they're doing that. And, uh, you know, and I don't remember if any of the other guys had moved up the roster yet, or left the roster to go to WWF, but, but the talk was in there. You know, the, the buzz was around that it was going to be a feeder system. So I was, I had convinced myself I'm going to WWF. There's no way around it. You know, I'm, I'm look at me next to the rest of the, the, the rest of these hillbillies, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not Cornette or Heyman, but I'm right under them is how I saw myself at the time in my, you know, fucking uh, arrogance <laughs> and, and, and youthful <laughs> cluelessness. But, um, so I'd gotten, I, I started really fucking off at my day job and, uh, like intentionally breaking furniture and stuff like that. I'd be on a, on a, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, like a forklift thing that would go up like two stories high to move, like <laughs> say a, uh, a big dresser. And with right. these forklifts, you could do this because they're electric. It wasn't like hydraulic brakes. When you, when you let go of the throttle or whatever you call it, the thing stopped on a dime. And if you weren't really careful, shit would go flying off of that pallet. So because I'm sure I'm going to New York uh, to be a star in WWF, I'm just kind of showing off to the people I work with. Like, fuck you guys. You guys can stay here with your blue collars. I'm going, I'm going to go be a TV star. And I started breaking furniture. So I would be hauling ass on these forklifts and I would slam on brakes and go, oops. And like a, a fucking expensive Oak or cherry, uh, dresser or whatever you call it would go flying, you know, because of inertia would just go flying off the end of the thing, hit the ground from two stories in the air and just shatter. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, to a degree, you can write that kind of shit off as an accident, but when it's happening two and three times a day, because you've got some asshole who thinks Smoky Mountain's going to make him a millionaire, you know, so, uh, <laughs> you know, put up with it. So I had just gotten fired from my day job, but I wasn't, you know, I was sure any day now I was getting the call in between there. Paul Heyman called me now, uh, Paul Heyman, I'd whatever squirreled his name away from Barry Horowitz or somebody a few years earlier. And I would speak to Paul occasionally on the phone and he would talk to me about maybe bringing me into the early East, early incarnation of ECW uh, b before it became, you know, the barbed wire hardcore thing. Right, <laughs> and, right. Um, excuse me. and so I get a phone call from Paul Heyman about a day after day or two after I'm fired. And after I've been fired, I went on a binge. I believe I was fired on a Friday. So I go on a weekend binge and I'm just hammered, pissed off that I lost my job and kind of celebrating. Heyman calls me and says, hey, is it true uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling is going out of business? Now, then that scared me because, oh, shit, wait a minute. I lost my shoot job. But wait a minute, I, I can't be getting fired from Smoky Mountain. So I, I go into panic mode. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, I heard a, so, it was something about. Jim Cornette's wife was divorcing him and Cornette's lost his marbles and whatever. The whole company is going down the shitter. So, uh, first of all, I knew nothing about that. You know, I mean, I'd read in the sheets that Cornette, Cornette was starting to, uh, uh, catch heat, like in the pro wrestling torch and things like that, because there was like a 
riot and riot. Oh yeah, riot the the in in up. in late in late ninety three there was the what Wade Keller called the race riot, which Bobby Blaze has told me was not a race riot. It was a riot. Right. But it was a race riot and so all that had happened and the story had come out and, and by that point Corny had basically told Wade Keller if he ever sees him he's gonna fucking kill him. Um and so on and so forth. So yes, there was there was some, right. some heat between he and the torch at that point. Right, but there was within the sheets there was starting to be the equivalent of the social justice warriors movement. So Cornette started getting shit on or whatever. And I mean, I mean, I, I just, I can only go by what I was reading in the days. But right, you know, right. and he would, he would respond in print occasionally. You know, you know, basically, fuck you guys, kiss my ass, you know, whatever. But he was, and clearly, you know, he's under a lot of stress. But like an idiot, I get off the phone with Heyman that night or afternoon, whatever it was. And I called uh, Casey O'Connor, who was, uh, that's the guy who, whose car uh, Cornette beat up with a baseball bat. Yes, oh, I know that story. story. So Casey O'Connor was, I don't know, a, a, a runner, production assistant, whatever. But he was a cool guy. Got, you know, I had his phone number and I called him all drunk. And I said, hey, what's the story? I hear his wife's leaving him and he's going to close the promotion up. And KC told me, uh, Van Horn, you really need to mind your own fucking business. <laughs> he goes, don't worry about uh, Jim Cornette's marital status. Don't worry about the, you know, the status of the company. You just come here and do what you do. And that's the best thing I'm going to tell you. And I said, okay, well, thank you for your time. Well, then I sat around with my buddy and we drank some more. And then I really fucked up. I called, I think the girl's name was Pam Lawson or something like yeah. that. It was, yep. it was his Jamie, Jamie Engel, his personal assistant, you know. And I, after being told to shut my mouth, I drunkenly called her and asked her the same question. She pretty much said the same thing to me a little more sternly. And I hung up thinking, okay, well, I'm not going to talk about it. I get it. And not long after that, it might have been 30, 45 minutes later, the phone rings. Daryl Van Horn, Jim Cornette. Hey, what's going on? What are we doing next week? You stupid son of a bitch. What business is it of yours if I've got nine goddamn wives? And he just, I thought Dick Murdoch had cut a promo on me. This son of a, well, you know the promos he cuts on Russo or, or oh, yeah. Dick, Sling, Dick Suplex guy? He cut one of those promos on me. <laughs> I mean, just absolutely fucking destroyed me. And I'm sitting there going, Jim, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't, you know, uh, you know, I got fired and, you know, I got fucked up and, you know, I was just nervous. And, uh, and, he, and he just promoted me for like 30, 30 minutes. Stop. And, you know, towards the end of it, he finally, I guess he, probably realized that even though he'd called me a stupid, clueless motherfucker repeatedly, um, I think he may have taken a little pity and thought, okay, maybe he really is a stupid, clueless motherfucker. And, and he told me at the time, well, you know what? He goes, everybody now knows this because you ran your fucking mouth. You know, he goes, you know, it's like a game of telephone. So the word is already spread that you're calling, telling everything that, my, that I'm, uh, I'm leaving my wife or whatever the story was. And he said, so I can't bring you back right now. So maybe take a little time off and we'll bring you back. But that never, you know, wound up never happening. But that is how I wound up leaving. And just for the record, you and you and Cornette are, are all in good terms these days. But uh, that was uh, oh, yeah. that was how it, that was how yeah. it ended in 1994. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, um, I mean, I spoke to him. I don't know six months after that. I spoke to him a couple times over the years, looking for gigs in WWE. And and we were friendly. And then when I ran into him in uh, TNA, when he uh, had the misfortune of, uh, or he would say the misfortune of working there under Dixie. Um, yeah, we, we, and we got along great. Of course, I did piss him off again there. <laughs> towards, <laughs> towards, uh, uh, because I accidentally uh, dialed his phone number in the middle of the night, trying to... His his phone number, and my wife's phone number, were one one space apart on the uh, friends list or whatever you call it, the uh, call list. <laughs> and uh, I accident I was sitting in a room partying with the boys, and I 
depressed, uh, whatever, you know, I hit my fat fingers, you hit the wrong damn thing. And I look down on it as I'm sitting there talking shit with a room full of drunk wrestlers. And I saw it, it said Cornette or whatever on the screen. And I hung up the phone quickly and I went, oh shit. It's like, and he was real wound up about something that night. But I forget why he was mad. He had a shitty ride or a shitty trip or something. And I, I said, oh fuck guys, this isn't cool. I just called Cornette. You know, it's like four or five in the morning. And he goes, nah, it's fine. He didn't answer, did he? And I said, no, but I, no, I, I've already, I was yelled at him, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, whatever it was. And sure enough, he called me back <laughs> just a few minutes later. You stupid motherfucker. Blah, 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 blah. Now, of course, he wasn't in a position to fire me, but he just basically threatened to kill me if I got anywhere near him. <laughs> and so, um, and, and here's an interesting little story. I, I don't think I even told Cornette this. Um, after that, so I didn't, I mean, we worked and occasionally Cornette would be the agent for our matches in TNA and he would give me the finish, but you know, there was no more shooting the shit like, like homeboys. And I was terrified, you know, that's like, I don't know. I mean, if your hero is, uh, uh, I don't know shit about sports, name a sports hero, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali. Yeah. You know, if you're a boxer, Muhammad Ali cuts a promo on you. You know what I mean? You, you, yeah. You know, I just like, ah, shit. So I just stayed out of his way. And what Cordette would do then, every time he walked by me, you know, because, you know, you, we, it wasn't awkward enough to where we wouldn't, I would not look at him, but we'd have to pass, cross paths occasionally, several times a day. And he would be my boy, like Jim Barnett, the old <laughs> motor from NWA. Yeah. And yeah. anybody who knows about Jim Barnett, you know, he was an old queen and all that. But I I realized that my boy was sort of like his uh his way of saying, uh, fuck you. <laughs> you know? But uh, uh, uh anyhow, toward, towards the uh right right before I left TNA, I actually took him to the because oh, oh I was gonna say, I was getting this custom made devil cane built, right? And I was going to have it made out of, I don't know, plastic or something else. I had a guy sculpt it and all this. And then uh, after Cornette told me he was going to kill me, or, or, you know, I'm sure he was going to murder me, but you know. You yeah, know, yeah. If I ever pissed him off, he was, he was going to beat shit out of me. So I called the, I, I canceled the guy who, I had mold made, but I canceled the guy who was going to make it out of some weak shit. And I found a, uh, it's called a foundry or whatever, where they deal with steel. I had it made out of the head, the devil head on it, made out of stainless steel. <laughs> Cost me like $1,700 for them to make Shit. one of them. Because I was like, if Cornette goes to kicking my ass, I'm going to have to go after his knees with my stainless steel. You know, it's like a giant biker ring. You know what I mean? With the, all the horns and points. And yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was, I was that fucking terrified. I didn't want to do it. And I'm not saying, you know, that's the reason I made the thing. I spent seventeen hundred dollars making out of stainless steel is because I was like, if this guy goes to trying to whip my ass. I got no choice but to try to hit him, you know, with, with my gimmick, you know. But uh, <laughs> but after but no, everything was fine because eventually I didn't. I was uncomfortable with the uncomfortable silence and the my boys, and I uh, took him to the side. And I said, I uh, just wanted to ask you, can we squash this? And he really didn't even remember what he was mad about. You know, and he said, well, there was a couple things going on and one was, you know, a bad day and a bad trip and whatever else. But it basically it was washed. And then I've run into him in the conventions over the years and everything's fine. Cornette's, yeah. Cornette's cool with me. 